If you have ever watched Netflix, you know that you can't record it. You can't download it. You cannot do anything. For example, I am on Netflix right now. And if I play this video, for example, you will see that this video is playing black, right? You can see, I, even I cannot see this video, right? But the moment I stop this video recording, which is going on. So my screen is getting recorded right now. But the moment I stop this, it will automatically like become visible. So you can see in the preview frames, I'm able to see the preview. I can see the caption. I can also hear the audio. But I cannot record this. I cannot download this. There is no way to, if I right click this, inspect this, even if I find something that would be like pretty much garbage. How does this work? Let's figure this out. So for a very long time, I tried to understand what this exactly is because this is one of the things that we offer on Fermion also. So if you go to fermion.app to set up your own platform where you are selling, let's say courses or content, optionally, you can opt into a feature that is known as DRM, DRM protection with wide wine and fair play. So we'll discuss about this because I had to research this. I had to talk to companies like Google. Also, I have like one of my point of contacts in Google who told me how this thing exactly works works from a pricing point of view. So I'll share that information with you in this video. Hopefully this is useful for you. This information, first of all, okay, let's, let's start with DRM in general. So DRM stands for digital rights management. And this is sort of a way for companies like Netflix, for example, or like Amazon prime or like Hulu or all these players like us, for example, at Fermion, if you're selling your courses, a way for your client, the system on which the video is running to protect it itself some capacity, right? Now DRM by nature, by definition, it's not bulletproof. It's not foolproof because at the end, the video is getting played, right? I can always take my phone and just start recording the screen like that, right? But till a lot of extent, it prevents a lot of piracy because you can't just download it directly. You can't just screen record it. All of that is prevented. So how does that work? So before understanding DRM, let's just take a step back and understand a few more basic things, right? So let's say that this is a playable video format. This is a playable mp4 file right your typical files which you download on your computer and play with vlc media player for example what happens is that there are certain things you can do with this file to make it encrypted right one of the most common ways is that you will encrypt this file with something called as aes 128 encryption so aes is an advanced encryption scheme it's an algorithm basically that takes this file for example and it encrypts it into some garbage right so this becomes a garbage file however However, in order to decrypt this file, what you need are two keys. The first is an encryption key and the second is an initialization vector IV. So these are like two pieces of inf information. You plug it in, you get this file back. And if you plug it back in, you will get this file back again, right? So you will get a playable MP4 again. So the first level of DRM, which is like a basic level DRM clear key encryption, it works exactly like what I told you over here. So what you will do is you will take a playable file. You will use AES encryption somehow 128 encryption to encrypt that file and you will get these two pieces of information key and initialization vector so what's going to happen is that now this particular file this file would go on some cloud storage right so it could be like it could be anything like s3 r2 hertzner storage whatever whatever you want to call it right so this corrupted file or whatever this file encrypted file would go on the cloud storage these two things ideally would go inside your database right so this goes into cloud storage this goes into database and now, whenever somebody, let's say a user comes, so a user comes over here and they want to play this video, whatever that video is, right? So they will request for a playback. So they say, I want to play back this video. What you will say as a server right here, EC2 or whatever, Lambda, whatever this is, is that you will verify user access, right? Obviously, first things first, then you will return signed URL for clear key encrypted video, right? Which is this garbage over here and return key and IV over here here, right? So once you return all of this in either in a single call or in multiple calls, for example, doesn't matter. Once you do all of this, the user is now able to play back the specific video. However, this is very basic, right? And it will not achieve what we just saw on Netflix that the video recording gets stopped or the screen goes blank when you're trying to record. So what's happening here? Well, you see that this over here is known as clear key encryption. The reason for this is that even though you can mess around with this key and all, uh, you know, you can just make it a little bit encrypted so that the client 
student has to do some work to decrypt the key itself in order to resume the playback. But still, this key is getting transmitted in clear fashion, right? It's clearly, you know, you are able to see as a user, you are able to right click, inspect inside the browser, go to the networks tab, you are able to intercept that key. That is why this is known as clear key encryption, where you encrypt the key with a certain key, which is like AES encryption. The encryption itself is very strong. You cannot break it without a key, but the key transfer happens in like plain sight, basically. Or even if you are doing some sort of manipulation over here, you can possibly decrypt it over here, right? Now, what Google and Apple did then is that they said, okay, this looks bad. What we don't want to do is like, you know, we want to encrypt the video. So this part we want to do, obviously, we have to use it in a certain way. Now they might or might not use the exact same algorithm. They might use something else also. They want to use the same encryption keys and all of that. But what they don't want is people to have the ability to see this key in plain text. That is number one. Second thing is that they want to retain access of the devices, the quality of devices on which these things are played on. Let me give you an example. For example, you might have heard that there are certain phones that restrict Netflix quality to 480p or 780p, 720p, right? Or there are certain browsers, for example, Firefox on Linux, they are not able to play Netflix at all. How does that work? So in that specific case, let's talk about DRM Widevine encryption. So Widevine is an encryption scheme which is developed by Widevine itself, but acquired by Google in some years back, right? So that's why that's why on Fermion also we say that inbuilt DRM protection is with Widevine and Fairplay because Widevine in general is an encryption. It's a DRM basically, which is developed by Widevine as a company, but it's owned by Google now. And this is like, these are the service provider which Widevine has, devices which Widevine has directly tied up with, Chrome and Firefox included, right? So how this fundamentally works is that, let me tell the whole scheme. So from starting, you will take a video file, playable MP4, let's say, and I'm gonna keep it simple. So I'm gonna miss out on a lot of steps and I'm gonna simplify this a bit, but the general idea remains same. What you do is you use something like CLI tool, Shaka player, etc., etc. Like there are a couple of options you can do over here. So this over here, what it does is that it does the same thing. It gets, you know, converted into some garbage file. But what you also have to do now is inform Google about this piece of content. This is where the magic lies, right? So over here, what you do in a very abstracted way is that you make an API call, API call to Google servers and you inform them about this content thing, right? So this Shaka player, not only just when you, when you encrypt it, it does not just give you this encrypted file, but it also gives you like content ID and a few more metadata around that. So you have to inform Google about some of these metadata IDs, right? And then Google, once you inform Google about this specific thing, Google registers this content piece inside their database. Now remember, Google does not upload the file itself, right? So it doesn't has the copy of the file. So they are not like offering you free storage or anything, but they are offering you a license server, basically. Think of this as a licensing server, right? So this is one, one thing. Now, the next thing what happens is that once this whole process has happened, what you're going to do as a user, you're going to come back to this website, you're going to say, I am user, and then you're going to go ahead and request for playback again. But this time, what's going to happen is that your server would just return you, uh, this would say verify your identity, and then return you the encrypted file, right? So this specific file is the DRM protected file, which you cannot decrypt once you have this file. So what's going to happen is that on the user side, the client side, the player, whatever you are using, it would also include a licensing server call or something like that, right? So where, where do you have to like ask for the license for that specific file? So this is where the DRM thing starts to kick in, the Widevine thing starts to kick in. What happens over here is that right here in most of the environments, like if this is like a Widevine thing, in most of the environments, this control will be taken from the user land to whatever's the secure environment is. That is what is called as trusted PEE, not TPE, trusted execution environment. So if you look at T and then DRM Widevine, for example, so you will see that over here on Bunny, there are three levels of trusted execution environments, level one, level two, level three. So level one, for example, are highest security provided by Widevine. It mandates the devices, all of that. But the basic idea between these two, three, level one, level two, level three things is that how trusted is the execution environment where the key exchange is happening, right? So this trusted execution environment, what it's going to do, it's going to make some calls to the licensing server, right? So over here, this is the licensing server. This would return it a playback key, right? So it'll say, okay, the, here is your playback key. Now this key is not like you just, you know, get it by making a fetch call.
all. It's not like that. This environment itself includes a lot of metadata about the device, what's happening, what this trusted execution environment is, in general, who's using it, all of that. And the biggest thing is that this whole operation is like, it's obfuscated, right? So DRM is a security by obfuscation. That means that there is no material available assets that what this thing is. That is one of the things, one of the major differences you would have seen if you go to Chromium. Chromium, for example, the GitHub project or, you know, whatever their official place is. Over here, you would not be able to find the source code of this which ships with Chrome, right? So the difference, one of the big difference between Chromium and Chrome is that Chrome ships with the ability to decode DRM protected, widevine protected content because it ships with this module, this trusted executable, executable environment, execution environment, which only the Google Chrome team knows how the source code works, right? So it, you can sure, you can just take this browser and try to decompile it and reverse engineer it, but they have made it in such a way that it would be extremely hard to just sit and figure out how the whole data pipeline is flowing, right? And with that being said, they also often change it a lot of times. This algorithm keeps on changing every single time, right? You know, maybe like, I would not be surprised if they also change it over the air with some remote updates or with, you know, with every version. So all of that keeps, keeps on changing. But with DRM security level one, for example, this, this trusted execution environment is embedded inside the device itself. So you can see like over here, if you are trying to play back a video on L1 Widevine, that means that the decryption is not happening at all in the browser or in the software layer. It's on the hardware level decryption, right? And the content decoded are executed within the trusted execution environment. So this over here, it gets the playback key from the licensing server. It gets the video from here also. So over here, if you see, it gets the video content. And this, this is the brains of the operation, right? If you're able to hijack this specific environment, then you would be able to just download the video in a way, like extract out the video. But what this does is that it, it is smart and it just sends you frame by frame, right? Frame by frame video playback, right? So it's able to do this frame by frame video playback because this operates outside of your JavaScript world. It operates outside of your normal software world in L1 encryption and in general, like 100% outside JavaScript world. That is why if you go to Netflix and right click and inspect, you cannot see this key exchange happening because it's not happening on the browser software level. I mean, it is happening on the browser software level, but not on the JavaScript level. And that is why when you are inside Chrome, if you ever know inside Chrome, the highest supported resolution is 720p. Netflix highest resolution Chrome. So you see over here, the maximum resolution Netflix plays on Chrome is 720p. The reason for this is because Chrome by default does this trusted executable environment execution within their own software layer, right? They don't have access to hardware. I mean, they do, but they don't trust the hardware. But that is why when you, whenever you are watching Netflix on Google Chrome, you are restricted to a maximum of 720p because what they want is that even if you leak it somehow, the resolution is not very high. However, if you're using Safari, then you can go crazy, right? Safari supports up to 4K resolution on Netflix, but only if you're using Mac, Big Mac OS Big Sur or later and are subscribed to Netflix premium plan. The reason for this is because in Safari, if you are running it on Mac OS, if it is Safari, this decryption is happening on Apple's hardware. It's happening on the native hardware, right? So that's even more secure because I mean, reverse engineering a software is still easy, but if you have a trusted executable environment as a hardware chip inside a device, that is extremely hard to reverse, right? So if you look at Apple, fair play hardware. So if you look at this, some of these documentation from Apple, so they do tell you a little bit about, you know, what's happening over here and there, but nobody really ever talks about what happens inside this trusted executable environment because the source code is not available. Because if it is available, then you can reverse engineer what's happening, right? So the whole DRM ecosystem and the whole thing is built on two specific things. This licensing server, how this issues licenses is a completely mystery box, number one. And by the way, like you can, of course, build your own server in front of this. So you can have like, like your own EC2 that again does a lot of checks and all whatever it needs. And then it talks to this licensing server that is owned by Google. This is a Google server. So this is how it works fundamentally, right? At the end, there is a Google server, which is sitting the Widevine server, which is sitting for issuing the license. And then this part is on the client side is also controlled by Google or Apple respectively based on Widevine and Fairplay. And this is how they maintain this secrecy on how the decryption is happening. Because the license which decrypts the content is also generated by the server. 
server. This is like a timed license is attached to the device which for which it is specifically issued. So you cannot just take this license and just start playing it anywhere. At the same time, this decryption which is happening is also issued by like the software is written by Google and Apple respectively. So you cannot even like figure out unless you spend a lot of time figuring out what is happening. If you remember a few years back, Chrome had a vulnerability, vulnerability DRM issue. So Chrome 57 or something in 2016. Yeah. So if you remember this, I, yeah. So something happened. I don't remember the exact version of Chrome, but something happened in 2016 where there was a flaw in Chrome's implementation of DRM so that people, whoever wants to hack a certain stream of data, they were able to like very easily download the stream directly, right? So if I see this video, so now you can see that these are like, this is like a video which they are trying to play, which is a DRM protected and they are able to download the decoded video directly. So they were able to inject into Chrome's decryption pipeline and they were able to extract that video data directly and they were able to store it on their file system. Since then, of course, Chrome has patched that vulnerability and it's, it's basically a cat and mouse game, but it's not really a cat and mouse game also because decrypting this is so damn hard and the algorithm keeps on changing and it, there is so little information about how this environment works that it's like, it's like unless you are a reverse engineer guru or something like that, it's very hard for you to download a video which is DRM protected. Of course, people do it all the time because you will see like anything that appears on Netflix is available on torrent websites within the next few days. So that happens. There are software, there are people who are able to decrypt DRM also, but for a common man, like you, for example, if you're just a developer who's starting out, you just know a little bit of front end, a little bit of back end, even at your scale, you would not be able to decrypt this content, right? So all in all, this is how DRM in general works. And this server over here and this trusted executable environment is the secret sauce. Any service that you see outside of this, like, so if you see, for example, if I Google DRM protection services, right? So if you see all of this, Palicon, Lock Lizard, Gartner, Brightcove, Video Cipher, all of these, these are built on top of the services offered by Google and Apple, right? So Google and Apple issues only a few players in the space. Like there has to be a full thing. You have to go through a certain audit and wait and all of that. Once you do that, then and only then you can become this EC2 server, right? Then and only then you can become a service that can offer you the DRM protection. So what other people in the space do is that instead of like taking the service directly from Google, they take it from players like Video Cipher, for example. So if you go to their pricing, you will see that they are giving you a certain pricing, whatever this is, like includes the data and all of that. But this is not the real DRM. The real DRM is in fact indeed provided by Google and Apple. What this is, is an abstraction, a layer above that actual DRM. And you can also get that when you become a Google partner and an Apple partner, right? So you have to go through that whole thing in order to avoid this, you know, tax, which you have to pay additional money on top of it. But that's possible. So yeah, that's, that's all there is in DRM. That's also something that we offer on Fermion. So over here, if you see, for example, if you are inside a course and if you're trying to play, you would see that in this specific case, that video would play because we are using the clear key encryption. So if I go to like one of the schools who's using Fermion and I start to play that video, you will see that video right now because it's using clear key encryption. But if we switch, if the instructor asks us that, okay, I don't even want my video to be recorded and it has to flow through this wide wine and fair play pipeline, then we can enable that for them. And once we do that, it automatically like works how a Netflix like implementation would work. So yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. Hopefully you learned something new. That's all for this one. Make sure you like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video really soon.